This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Welcome to Rejoice, a ministry of Church Street United Methodist Church at the crossroads of downtown Knoxville, Tennessee. And I'm David Graves, one of the pastors, and thank you for making us a part of your Sunday morning. This time of year is a time of rejoicing as another Christmas is upon us. Today marks the third Sunday in Advent. And Advent is a time period of four Sundays before Christmas, a period of waiting, preparing, and perhaps reflecting on life where you are in your relationship with God. As I shared in my message last Sunday, Advent is a time of new beginnings, and perhaps you need a new beginning today. We all know someone who needs to begin again, or perhaps we need to give others a chance of a new beginning, because life is all about relationships, and the Christmas story is a story for all people. This morning my message is entitled, Why Let Her In? And we will turn first to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 5, which mentions a woman named Rahab. And then we'll hear her story in Joshua, beginning in chapter 2, verse 8. And have your Bibles ready to follow along with me. But first, let's listen as our parish women's choir shares in song. Last Sunday, my message was focused around why let them in from the first 17 verses of Matthew chapter 1. And these verses are so easy to skip over as they contain a genealogy, the family tree of Jesus beginning with Abraham, David, and including a whole host of characters, ending in verse 16 with the birth of Jesus. Most of the names in Jesus' family lineage are not recognizable to most people. Many of the names are hard to pronounce, yet when you study them, there are some real characters in the family of Jesus. You find murderers, thieves, traitors, and people who did not live a very good moral life. And Matthew seems to point to them as he writes this genealogy. When you study ancient history, genealogies were only for the rich and the famous, kings, queens, and emperors. What happened in those genealogies are that oftentimes people got left out. 
intentionally. For if you had a checkered past, let's leave them out. They are an embarrassment to the family. They are a problem. Problem? Let's just ban them from coming into our story. And Matthew knew what being an embarrassment was, for he did not have a chance in this world until he met Jesus. And Matthew chose to accept the gift that Jesus wanted to give him. And it changed his life forever until here we are, 2,000 years later, talking about Matthew and this gift he left with us. This genealogy is a gift for us, for Matthew reminds us that the Jesus story is a story for all people. And the Christmas story is a story that tells us we all have the opportunity for a new beginning. It also challenges us that we need to give other people a chance at a new beginning. And Matthew heightens the fact that it is a story for all people. It appears that we want to judge and exclude people based on race, nationality, and on what others in their tribe have done. And this mindset is rampant today. It's not easy following Jesus. Wouldn't it be nice if everyone in the world was like us? Our first response might be, yes, and then this world would be a better place. Yet if you take the time to think about it, if everyone were just like me or you, it would be a pretty dull world. What we need is for more people to be like Jesus. Matthew records for us today that everyone is included at the table. Chapter 1 includes 42 generations from Abraham to Jesus. Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. Solomon was the, was the father of Boaz. It would have been so easy right here. Um, and Boaz was the father of Obed. It been, but Matthew inserts in his genealogy, if he could have just gone on, but he inserts in his genealogy this mother who was Rahab. Come on, Matthew. Why did you do that? To make matters worse, she wasn't even Jewish. Rahab was a Canaanite woman. Not only that, she had a tag on her at the end of her name, and it was harlot. Rahab the harlot. You ever had a tag placed on your name? Perhaps you've had a name attached to your name, and some you liked and others that tugged at your heart really bad. And I have to admit that I have labeled people in negative ways over my life. I've judged a whole family based on one person's actions. And my feelings toward a sports team may be negatively affected by the actions of one or a few persons on the team. I didn't like them because of a particular him or her. And then that ex expands to politics. It moves to the color of your skin, to the actions of others and your nationality. And we judge people based upon a specific action of one or the part of a few. And friends, our world has grown darker. It seems we hold our breath, hoping and praying that another mass shooting will not take place. Will Knoxville or your community be next? The world was dark for Matthew because he was Matthew the tax collector. Years before, it was just Rahab. It was Rahab the harlot. And both of them didn't have a chance in the world until Rahab was touched by God and Matthew was touched by Jesus. Both were willing to receive the gift offered to them that changed their lives forever. And here we are thousands of years later talking about it this morning. And Matthew includes this mother Rahab, whereas everybody fills in the blank Rahab the harlot. Matthew just goes right on until he gets to Jesus. And this is problematic on two fronts. First of all, Rahab is in heaven. So you're going to meet her someday, so you better be careful about the blank. So as we will see in a few moments, I am going to give her a new name, Rahab the Helper. Secondly, Rahab, now the helper, was not even Jewish, as I mentioned just a few moments ago. She shows up in the Bible, and the stones engraved in the Ten Commandments weren't even cooled off yet. The nation of Israel had just gotten the Ten Commandments, and everybody who plays the prostitute or adultery has to be stoned. Not only that, good Jewish people were not supposed to associate with people who weren't Jewish. And suddenly comes into the Jesus story a woman who shouldn't have been mentioned, a prostitute. She was not Jewish. Rahab has no business being in this story. What, what's she doing here? Yet God wove her into our Christmas story. As I have studied and thought about this message for this morning, and just trying to be honest, I would not have invited Rahab to my Christmas party. 
but God wove her into my Christmas story because that is the story of Christmas. This is a story for all of us, especially for those who've had a storied past. You've got a past. In fact, you are new to the area and you are trying to have a new beginning. You hope nobody finds out about your past. You're married and there's something in your past that you hope your spouse does not find out about. You have a past and it's an embarrassment and you do not want others to find out about it. You're a Muslim or from the Middle East and you're wondering how are people going to judge and treat me? The list could go on and on. And for some people you are Bob the blank or Mary the blank. Something associated with your name, you have a past. And because you have a past that even ran up maybe until last night or this morning for some of you, your past has been hard, broken, or perhaps just plain downright ugly. And when you think of God, there is a distance. Your past has pushed you away from God, yet Christmas reminds us that we all have an opportunity for a new beginning. And perhaps you're out there seeking to build some kind of personal righteousness platform. You're, you're trying to connect or reconnect with God and you just can't get personal with God because you, have, you know what you've done and what you're doing. You know right now you need to change some things. Your past has alienated you from God. The good news is the Christmas story reminds us that our sin may alienate us from God, but our sin does not alienate God from each of us. Who let her in? Rahab. As we turn to Joshua chapter 2, Moses is dead. And Joshua has been given the mantle of leading the Jewish people into the promised land. The people of Israel are standing on the edge of the Jordan River. And on the other side await the much more powerful Canaanite people and their army. Joshua wisely sends two spies to the city of Jericho. And they get into the city and they spy out the situation. And somebody quickly sees them and they duck into a house which was built into the wall surrounding the city of Jericho. And lo and behold, the house they duck into just happens to be the home or lodge of a prostitute by the name of, you guessed it, Rahab. Rahab knew who the spies were and she took them up on the roof and hid them. There's a knock on the door and it's soldiers who said, we heard two men of Israel, two Jewish men were here. Please bring them to us. And this is the beginning of only what God could do for the soldiers were not going to come in. First, they did not know who might be in there. In addition, they didn't want anyone else reporting that they had gone into Rahab's lodge, I mean her home. Rahab responds, they were here, but before sundown they went out the city gate and if you hurry, you might catch them. And the soldiers take Rahab at her word and go away. And then Rahab goes back up to the roof, which was flat, and many things would have been stored there, and has a conversation with the two men, the two Jewish spies. And here we pick up the conversation in Joshua chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk with them. I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. For we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know that what you did in Sion and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people were completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord, your God, is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. In other words, your God is bigger than our God. And I believe in your God. And what people believed back in this time period is that every geographical area had a God. There was a God for every piece of dirt. And Jericho fears this God who is leading a nomadic people. And Rahab is communicating that she has come to believe in the one true God. I have more confidence in you two guys and your God than I do this entire city, army, king, or our history. And Rahab accepts the gift of the one true God. Verse 12, Now swear to me by the Lord that you will be kind to me and my family since I have helped you. 
Give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live along with my father, mother, my brothers and sisters, and all their families. We offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety, the men agreed. If you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. So a deal is struck. Hebrews in the New Testament would share many thousands of years later that Rahab's faith saved her. Two spies go back and tell Joshua that this is their time. We need to get down to the Jordan River and get to the city of Jericho. So Joshua gets his leadership together and presents the plan, God's plan. It was a little unusual, but the plan was for the people to go to Jericho. The people in Jericho were living in fear, and they were going to march around the city one time, then take a break for the day. The next day, they would march around the city one time and then take a break. And we're going to do this for six days. And then on the seventh day, we're going to change it up. We're going to march around the city seven times. And then we're going to shout and blow the trumpets. And when we, all, when we do, the walls are going to fall down. <laughs> if I would have been one of the people hearing this for the first time, I would have said, okay, you got anything else? Well, what's plan B? The point is not about our power and might, but what God is going to do. We are going to share as an example, not about our military might, but our God. It is one true God. And the people of Israel followed the plan, and lo and behold, on the seventh day, the Bible tells us the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. The city is captured. Rahab and her family's life is spared. Interesting that in recent years, there have been extensive archaeological work and digging on the actual site of the city of ancient Jericho. And what they discovered is that the walls are down, and they fell outward, serving so well as a ramp so the city could be taken easily. And then in Joshua chapter 6, as we move over, verse 22. Meanwhile, Joshua said to the two spies, Keep your promise. Go to the prostitute's house and bring her out along with all her family. And the men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, mother, brothers, and all the other relatives who were with her. They moved her whole family to a safe place near the camp of Israel. It looks like the nation of Israel took in some refugees. The Christmas story includes refugees. We have people advocating that we all carry guns and keep people out. As I said perhaps last week, we in the United States need to ask the world for a new beginning this Christmas. Now verse 25 drives home our message for this morning. So Joshua spared Rahab, the prostitute, and her relatives who were with her. Because she had hidden the spies, Joshua sent to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. Don't miss that. She lives among the Israelites to this day. The story of Rahab is filled so much for us today. God reaches in and says, I'm going to spare Rahab and her family, not because she's good, not because she repented, not because she was turned away from sin, not because she recognized it was sinful, but because she recognized who I am. In the midst of chaos, I spared Rahab and her family. I just wonder, because I really don't know, that Matthew is writing this genealogy, including everyone in the family of God, hoping you and I would get it. In a world that is chaotic, into a world that deserves judgment, and so many want to cast judgment, and people trying to figure out God, some seeking a, to build a platform of personal righteousness, others including and wanting to build walls, and nobody's getting that right into a world where God reached in and plucked out Rahab, plucked out Matthew the tax collector, and wants so much for you and me and everyone on this planet to know the great I am. God says to us this morning, drawing way back on, before we get to Bethlehem, a star, and Mary and Joseph and shepherds, a manger, and a cool Judean night, that the Christmas story God invites everyone to the table. God says, I am the God of judgment. I am the God of love, the God of grace and mercy and forgiveness. Our God is one who looks for ways to redeem people with a past so they can have a relationship with God and the body of Christ 
Advent and Christmas remind us like Rahab, we can have a new beginning. This story also deepens the thought that we too can have new beginnings with other people. We can't change other people, but we sure can change our attitudes, our hatred, can be released from our hearts, minds, and souls. We do need to care about others who are different from ourselves. There is this gap of time, and Matthew records it in his genealogy that one day a guy named Solomon sees Rahab, and this Jewish guy falls in love with Rahab, who you remember is now the helper. He married her. Solomon could have chosen many other Jewish women. God could have gone in many other directions, but God chose Solomon and Rahab to be the length to Jesus. Solomon and Rahab got married. They had a son, and his name was Boaz. Boaz met a woman named Ruth, and they had a son named Jesse. And Jesse had a son named David. And the rest of the story, many of you know, 42 generations later, Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary gave birth to Jesus, who was called the Messiah. I would not have invited Rahab to my Christmas party. And aren't you thankful that I'm not God, and I'm thankful you are not either? God says, I'm going to make Rahab an intricate part of the Christmas story. It's a perfect fit, because her story is my story and your story. The good news of Christmas is that your past, your present, will not stop God from forgiving you. For this story reminds us that all are welcome to the table of God. It answers the question, why is she here? Rahab, who once was called a harlot, has now been transformed into God's helper that Matthew wants you to know is a part of the Christmas story. It gives each of us great hope that we are all part of the Jesus story. What would be associated with your name? Do you place guilt, shame, anger, hatred, bitterness, or hopelessness, hopelessness beside it? Some of the hardest things you could say or label a person are, David, you're just hopeless. God rescued with Christmas from our past and our present circumstances. Christmas is God's loving judgment and mercy coming together. And just perhaps today, this is the gift you need to receive. And if you're like me, it's a gift I need to give to some other people. Christmas is a wonderful time to have a new beginning. What's she doing here? Who let her in? An angel of the Lord said, I bring you good news of great joy. Unto you is born a Savior, Christ the Lord. It's Christmas. And do you need a new beginning? Is there someone else you need to offer a new beginning to? Christ so much wants to give you a gift. The Christmas story is your story. I invite you to ponder these things as solo as Connor Cowart sings. Once in David's royal city, I invite you to worship with us.
Thank you so much for tuning in and worshiping with us this morning. The story uh, that Matthew gives us in chapter 1 of all these different names represent people just like you and I. And some had a storied past, and a person like Rahab finally realized the one true God, and it changed her life forever. I invite you to worship with us at Church Street on Sunday at 8.30 and 11 a.m., and Wednesday at 12 noon. And this Wednesday, we will have our blue Christmas service at 12 noon, because Christmas for some is a tough time of the year. It brings memories that are hard to deal with. It is especially hard when you've lost someone to death this past year. Perhaps it's your first Christmas without them. This Wednesday at noon, we will provide a worship service that we pray will bring healing to all those who attend. As always in our worship services on Wednesday, we serve Holy Communion and share in that. So I invite you to join us next Sunday. Our music ministry will share in our time of Rejoice TV. So let me take this opportunity to invite you to one of our four Christmas Eve services, 12 noon, 3 and 5 and 10.30 p.m. May your day be blessed. And remember that our God is a God of new beginnings. Everyone is invited in. In these days of living in a world that is filled with fear and terror, unto you is born a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. I ask you to join me in praying for peace, and may God's peace be with you. Members and friends of Church Street United Methodist Church, your downtown church to the corner of Henley and Main, would like to thank you for joining Rejoice. Please send us your comments and suggestions and be sure to tune in next Sunday at this same time for Rejoice. Rejoice.